I'm going to talk a little bit about why girls need to be part of our future and technology future. And I'm also going to tell you a little bit about my story. So I hope you find that interesting and I'll be very interested to hear your questions as well. But what I wanted to do was to start off with a fact that you may or may not know. There was somebody called Ada Lovelace and you can see she is a woman and she was she's considered to be the first computer programmer. Um, and she worked with Charles Babbage. You, you might have heard of Charles Babbage. And he was an early mechanical general purpose computer um, in, involved with the analytical engine. But what they found was that Ada's notes on the engine, um, what she did is she was the one that had the first algorithm that was intended to be carried out by a machine. So she was a very smart lady. But certainly back in the 1800s, uh, women were more support type people and weren't necessarily recognised for their work. So if you have a look at uh, this slide here, you see at the bottom here I've got a link to Wikipedia so you can go and have a look at her very interesting life story. But what she talked about is she had poetical science ideas. So that led her to ask lots of questions about what was called the analytical engine or the, the early computer and examining how individuals and society relate to technology. So she wasn't just interested in the technology or computers themselves. She was interested in how people interact with technology. And that's something that I've always been very interested in. So I think that, that it's really important to understand that girls, women, have underpinned a lot of programming and a lot of computer technology over the years. So why do we need to be interested in technology and information systems? So on this slide, I have some recent technology trends. Have you all heard about the driverless cars? Is that yes? Yes. Driverless cars. So um, Google, Volvo are all um, involved in the driver, uh, in driverless cars. So maybe, I'm not sure if you're um, thinking about getting your L's very soon or not, but... Um, Maybe 10 years down the track, you won't need to do that. Certainly robotics, robots uh, um, are, are a trend. 3D printers, I'm sure you've heard of those. Uh, the Internet of Things, big data is a term that's been around for a while now. Uh, broadband that allows us to download and upload videos wherever we are, almost anywhere. And I imagine that you've all got smartphones and uh, technology that you do that. Apps that monitor our fitness, our health, our sleep, everything. Uh, wearable technologies. I mean, I wear a uh, sports watch to monitor my runs and uh, when I swim and do those sorts of things. And, of course, social media. And I imagine that you've all got some sort of social media account. I know my 15-year-old uh, son certainly does. And I'm not sure what he does on it, but he but he uh, is very involved with social media. That's how you interact with your friends. So our world, the way we work, the way we live, the way we play, the way we interact with our friends, the way we communicate is all driven by technology. So it's something that we want to be part of in terms of the decisions that we make about technology. And you need to be part of that. I need to be part of that. So there's lots and lots of opportunities, of course, with technology. So more flexible work. And uh, so, for example, in my job, I can, um, I can work from home some days a week, which means that I can go to school functions, I can get my son to basketball, I can have a good work-life balance. Um, it gives us some diversity in the, in the sort of jobs that we can do. Another really uh, important opportunity, of course, is sustainable cities. So smart transport infrastructure, waste management, reducing energy, all of those sorts of things. They're all going to help us in the future. And a very big area that's increasingly uh, going to be, certainly in the next 10, 20, 30 years, is better health care. So as we have an ageing population and as we have more um, issues around 
health and monitoring health conditions and keeping people in their homes when they age, having technology that monitors people in their homes, being able to have equitable access to healthcare is really important because in a lot of regional and remote areas in Australia, for example, people don't necessarily have access to the sort of health care that we might get when you live in uh, a city like Sydney, where we are. So keeping people at home rather than in a hospital, keeping people out of hospitals because often when you go to hospital, you get sicker. And of course, another major opportunity, of course, is access to education. So you can access education wherever you are. So we have these um, massive open online courses now where you can talk to anybody anywhere. And I'll talk more about that in a moment. So we have lots of opportunities. So technology is good. However, technology can be bad. So we need to manage it. And I've got a little um, board here that says uh, that was outside a coffee shop, a cafe that says, no Wi-Fi here. We don't have Wi-Fi. Talk to each other. So are we losing the ability to communicate and chat? Okay. So, for example, my 15-year-old uh, son, when um, what I do at night time is uh, I turn the Wi-Fi off. And you know what upsets him more than anything is he can't talk to his friends after about 9.30 at night, which is tragic, I know. I'm a bad mother, not good. But, um, you know, when, he's talk when I say, well, what are you doing? He says, I'm talking to my friends and I can't hear any talking going on at all. It's all, it's all messaging. So that leads me to this issue about technology addiction. So one of the rules I have in my house is that uh, all the technology has to be out of his bedroom at night time. My bedroom as well. I don't have my phone in my bedroom. So there's issues with problems with sleep and problems with being able to switch off and having good quality sleep. The next one you might uh, be familiar with, fear of missing out. So if everybody's sort of chatting and involved in a conversation or involved in doing something on social media and then you don't have access to that, you can feel, you can feel like you're missing out. And, that, and there's a bit of uh, research going on in that area and that's something we have to be aware of. And being connected 24 hours a day, seven days a week, that can't be good. That can't be healthy. Another major uh, issue or a consequence of technology being available all the time is managing distractions. So, for example, I'll give you another example uh, in your context is that studying. So if you're studying for your sort of end of year exams, for example, um, at the same time, you can be playing video games or chatting to your friends or listening to music and having all those different distractions rather than focusing on studying is a very difficult thing to do. The next issue is connections with each other. So we're not in the moment. I don't know if you've noticed this, but if, you're, if I'm walking around at a shopping centre, I'm walking around here at Macquarie University, often people run into me because they're not looking up watching where they're going they're doing this looking at their phones and that is that is a big issue as well is not being in the moment um, people having dinner and rather than having dinner and having a conversation around a dinner table everybody's looking at their phones so connecting with each other's with each other, comparing ourselves with other people. So, for example, if we look at social media and we see other people doing fun things or um, doing stuff that we're not doing or they look better than us or whatever it is, we can feel a little bit, like, left out. And another major uh, issue, I think, is privacy. Often we share too much, okay? People share everything and uh, maybe we need to reconsider that. Because as we move into the world and you go for job interviews, for example, the first thing your potential employer will do is look at your social media. Um, and uh, it's very easy for them to be able to do that and see what you've been up to. Now, this is the ugly part of technology. These are some issues that we need solving and they're issues that you can be, you can be part of the solution. And I think that these issues we can solve together. So 
According to the Australian Bureau of Statistics, Australians are amongst the highest users of technology. And as I said earlier, that can be a good thing, but it can be a bad thing. So we have to be able to manage that. A major, major issue around the world is e-waste. It's harming the environment and, of course, people's health. So hazardous substances that leach into soil and water, landfill, renewable resources not used properly, those sorts of things. And so what happens is what we want often because it's marketed to us, is we want the newest version of whatever it is. So Apple iPhone 6S is a pretty good phone, right? As I understand it, I don't have one. But um, that, is, that is apparently a really good phone. So what people want to do, even if their current technology works perfectly adequately, they want to have the next version. So what happens to your old technology? What's happening to that? Where is it going and um, who is it harming? Are we able to recycle it? What can we do with that? And I think that that is a major issue as technology. um, And you can see a picture I've got on that slide there of um, people trying to go through some of this e-waste. Another major issue, of course, is cybersecurity. And uh, you probably would have heard some of this in, in recent news stories so the majority of people in a, in a survey, I've got a, a link here to a global survey, found that the majority of respondents believe that cybersecurity is among the top three threats facing businesses today. So if we go back to some of those major trends, you look at the um, driverless car, for example. Now, if the security is not there and somebody, and this has happened, and somebody can hack into that car and control it, then that could have all sorts of implications, couldn't it? So that is an example of cyber security and where we have to manage manage this. So you can see um, that some of these issues need resolution, and I think they can be solved. But on the you know, but we all need to work together in order to solve them. They're not going to go away by themselves. All right, so now I'm going to tell you a bit about my story. This is me in year 10 in 1979. Ancient, ancient history for you, I know, but not not such ancient history for me. And I put a circle around who I am because I know you wouldn't be able to figure it out. And you can see I came from a very small country town. This is my whole of my year 10 class. So... um, And a lot of those people uh, I haven't kept in contact with And that was our maths teacher. (laughs) He was a very good maths teacher too. I liked him a lot. So, year 10, a long time ago. So what's happened since then? So I came from this small country town, and the town is called Barrowville. It's up on the... um, uh, up on the... up in between Coffs Harbour and Kempsey. And you can see there's a picture there of Um, the school, there's a picture of the town and there's a picture there of the post office and that post office is where I lived with my family. So my father was a postmaster, that's what we called them then, my mother worked there and there was a door that went from the post office into the house. So that's where we lived for a long time. So I've got a few facts about Barrowville up on the slide, I don't need to Uh, read them to you. But in 2011, there were 1,208 people living in Barrowville. So, and and there were a number, and there is a number of Indigenous people. So when I went to school, when I went to Barrowville High School, it only went to year 10. And um, my classmates in, um, in, in high school, I had a number of Indigenous friends. And some lived outside of town and some lived inside the town. So that's where I came from and that's where we, uh, where I mostly grew up. So why have I ended up here? So this is, this is a little bit about my journey. So the school I went to, Barrowville Central School, went up to year 10. So I had to change schools to go to year 11 and I didn't finish year 12. So that's a bit tragic, isn't it? (laughs) But... I realised that that was a bit of a mistake 
So I went to TAFE, I came to Sydney, I got a job, I went to TAFE and I did a typing course to begin with because I needed to do, I needed, I felt that with computers that I needed to touch type. So that's the first thing I did. Then I did my HSC at TAFE to try and get into a university course. And I tried to get into Macquarie University as a mature age student, but they rejected me. So that was pretty tragic. I was pretty upset about that. However, um, I picked myself up and I dusted myself off and I applied at Charles Sturt University at Bathurst. So I did that externally. So I did that by distance education. So I did a Bachelor of Business Computing and Management Information Systems. But as you can see here, I was very bad at programming. In fact, I had to repeat the programming unit because I was so bad at it. But I persevered and I tried to do it. And in those days, when I, when I did this, the way you had to code was you had to sort of write it down on paper and send it in. So I couldn't even do it online. Um, however, I got through that and I graduated. Then I did an MBA professional accounting and then I did a PhD in information systems. So the way that I did that, and I did that while I was working full time, I worked in the banking sector and I worked in IT and I did, uh, I did all of that uh, while I was working full time. So it was the hard way to do it. However, it was really important that I had support from my husband. So uh, he was really supportive and when I needed to study on weekends and those sorts of things, he was very supportive. And even while I was doing these uh, other qualifications, I used to spend a lot of time at Macquarie University in the library. So even though I wasn't accepted here as a student, um, that's what I did. So that took a number of years, as you can imagine. Uh, and these are my... These are my um, these are my degrees here, so uh, I took photos of them. So here's a, there's a Bachelor of Business, Computing and Management Information Systems, and uh, the, the Master of Business Administrations and uh, my PhD. So I'm very proud of those because it took me so long to get them. So what am I doing now? Okay, so let me tell you a bit about what's happening now. So. I now am a lecturer and unit convener. I'm a senior lecturer now, and um, I lecture and a unit convener for postgraduate and undergraduate management information systems unit. So what I do is I teach information systems in business. And that's really important because the focus is not on the technology per se, but how we use technology. So the students that I teach are the ones that are going to be the decision makers about technology in their organisation. So I think this is a very important area for students to be aware of. I'm a researcher and author, so I've, I've done research and published in journals, conference papers, book chapters. Um, I've been uh, an author on a textbook and I've also been invited to um, submit industry publications. And I've also been in the media, so I've been on the television and I've been in newspapers and on the radio. So that's really good, isn't it? I mean, it means that, that, that what I'm researching and interested in is, is, getting, is getting out there and people are interested in it. Um, you see a picture up there. This is, this is uh, when we, uh, this is my, my son and my husband and our tour guide. We went on a bicycle ride in um, Cambodia. It was fantastic. And um, there's another photo there of my son and I in Hawaii at the beginning of the year where I went to a conference, and uh, that was very interesting. I also like to run, so that's me uh, running in the uh, <laughs> running in the Blackmores Running Festival. I did the nine k's, and um, I got third in my age group, so I'm trying to get faster. So. Uh, I was going to do the half marathon, but I was injured, so I had to do the shorter distance. So I do a lot of running and I'm into fitness and those sorts of things. Um, and another um, passion of mine, I, was, I suppose, is Zonta. So Zonta International is an organisation that is about um, supporting women. And it's, 
I, I was the president for a couple of years in the Zonta Club of the Northern Beaches here in Sydney, and I'm the Status of Women Chair now. But what we do, and I think that this is very relevant, is we, um, we provide study grants. So for women in financial difficulty, we provide study grants for women in, um, that are doing university, uh, u- university courses and we support uh, women from the uh, refuge, so domestic violence, uh, people that have experienced domestic violence and they need to get a job, so we help them with TAFE courses, for example. And the other thing that we do is that girls that uh, that are at school on the northern beaches, going into years 11 and 12... If they need help for um, their artwork or some other financial support to try and keep them in school, we we also help them as well. So uh, as you can see, I have have quite a lot lot of things that I do. So let me sum up before we start talking about, uh, uh, before we have some questions. So technology is a disruptor and it's here to stay. Okay, that is a fact. So we've got technology, we're all using it, we're all part of it. Um, there, are, there are issues with technology that we should be aware of, but we're all part of the solution as well. I think that that's really important. And the reason why girls in particular should understand technology is because we need to be making informed decisions about technology and what it can do and what, it, and, and, and what the limitations of technology might be. We've had predictions over many years about what technology is going to, uh, what technology can do. And a lot of those predictions um, have been inaccurate, but of course some, some are not. And we know that technology is changing the way we work, live, play, study. We know that, okay? And you're part of the solution, just like we are. And at the bottom of the slide here, you will see that did you, did you see that Asina O'Neill um, decided that she was going to disconnect from social media a couple of weeks ago and she said that she had half a million Instagram followers, more than 250,000 YouTube subscribers and her Snapchats were watched by more than 60,000 and she signed off social media for good um, at the end of October because... She said that social media is not real and she was explaining that social media sets up really false expectations for people because the types of photos that she put up took her a long time to style them, you know, to get her makeup right and to style the photos and those sorts of things. And um, a lot of the fashion that she would wear, she was paid to do that and that's not disclosed. So the social media not real article I think is very interesting and that links back to what I said about the fear of missing out. So when we look at social media and we think people um, are having these fantastic lives and doing things um, that we would like to do, it's fake. A lot of it is fake. It's made up and people are paid to do it. So we have to be realistic about what social media can and can't do in terms of connecting us and providing opportunities for collaboration Uh, And those sorts of things are very important. But if you believe everything that's on social media, you will end up comparing yourself to something that is not real. Uh, And the other little item I've got up there is an organisation, of course, that's very involved in ethical clothing. And and, um, I think that that might be worth a look if you're interested as well. So really thinking about technology and how technology can actually make a difference and what the the benefits might be, what the uh, issues are that we can manage in our day-to-day lives and also what some of the bigger issues might be that we can be part of the solution. And finally, what I wanted to say is that There's lots and lots of jobs out there, lots of jobs that aren't necessarily programming. And I already explained that programming, I'm just terrible at programming. (laughs) 
<laughs> but I've done a lot of jobs that involve technology and information systems. So here are some possible jobs here. So user interface designer. So the way we interact with technology and design apps, thinking about how a website should look and working with programmers is an interesting job. Content strategy, where you work on blogs, social media to share information with customers. So all organisations need people like that in order to help them manage that. Uh, web analytics uh, and big data, project management, business analysts, change management. So there's a whole lot of roles and jobs in the, that, that uh, exist today and jobs that will exist in the future that we don't even know about that need some level of technology understanding and proficiency. So I have a little um, saying up here, education should prepare young people for jobs that do not yet exist using technologies that have not yet been invented to solve problems of which we are not yet aware. And I thought that really summed up what I've been trying to say today, is that really we don't know where we're going to be in 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, but if we have some understanding of technology, and even though we use technology, we're all using social media, we have our smartphones, understanding, having a deeper understanding of how, not just how technology works, but what the, what the issues are, is really fundamental for being able to um, be able to take opportunities of what roles might be possible in the future. So thank you. The Doctor of Philosophy. So what a Doctor of Philosophy does, what a, what, a, what a PhD is, so what happens is you do your undergraduate degree, which is usually three years, sometimes four years, and you take particular subjects and you have an exam or not always an exam, but you have certain um, assessment tasks and those sorts of things at the end of each semester. And then at the end you get a... Um, you know, you graduate with your undergraduate degree. Then you have masters, which is often coursework, a, a, a similar thing. Sometimes there might be a bit of research. But with a PhD, a PhD is an independent piece of research. So what you do is you have a particular research problem uh, and research questions. And then what you have to do is you have to find out what research has been done in the past where there might be a gap, and then what you do is you find a way to answer that research question. And it has to be a contribution to knowledge. So what I did in my PhD is I looked at e-commerce and the implications for human resource management in the banking sector. Okay, so what did that mean in terms of managing people? So that's so a PhD can take, uh, it took me nearly seven years to do that. Well, I had a baby as well, you know, in, in, in between, like, at the same time. <laughs> no, what we have to understand is when it's appropriate to connect using technology, when it's appropriate to connect face-to-face. So it's having the ability to understand the difference. So in some organisations, for example, Yahoo, they don't allow people to work from home at all, for example, um, because they believe that everybody needs to be in the office in order to collaborate in, and work together, whereas some other organisations are happy for people to work from anywhere, work from home, work from co-working centres. So it's about understanding when it's appropriate to be able to connect via uh, technology and when, it's when, and, and when that might not be an appropriate thing to do. So if you're dealing with particularly complex issues, for example, the human-to-human -human connection is still really important. interesting thing I I'm learning stuff all the time I one of the most interesting things I did was um uh 
What's today? Last week, last Friday, I did a webinar to the Canadian government on flexible work. And it was really interesting because it means that being able to connect to people uh, all around the world is fantastic. And the technology that we used was called Zoom. And uh, the week before that, I had been in Brisbane at a conference and the keynote speaker came in from London on Zoom technology. And it was in a big conference hall and it worked beautifully. So I think that that's what I find really interesting, being involved in new technology and uh, my research is around flexibility of work and working anywhere. And, and I think that being able to go and talk to people about that and being involved with the technology is really interesting. I've got one son, that's it. <laughs> and as I said, he's 15. He's doing IST as his elective. He's just finishing year nine. Um, what, he's just, what he would like to do when he finishes school is uh, he wants to be a personal trainer and a games designer. However, in recent days, and this is just days, he's thinking about maybe he'll be involved in technology hardware and fixing that because um, a couple of <laughs> a couple of days, Monday night I was out, I came home and he clicked on a link he shouldn't have, which... Um, infected his computer with a Trojan and I had to call uh, I couldn't fix it so I called um, I called Geeks to You I don't know if you've heard of this organization but very good <clears throat> I was working from home yesterday so I was able to get the guy to come in and and uh, fix it but what Nicholas had done my son is he'd saved up all his money to buy all the computer parts and he built the computer himself from scratch. And, uh, and then he bought the case and put the case there. So when I was organising this service call, I deliberately made a phone call rather than uh, do it via the web to explain that it, what, you know, that it, was a, it was a built computer. So he's really interested in all of those sorts of things. Well, oh, there's lots of technology that's used in, in architecture. I can't, um, but there is software that architects use in order to design uh, buildings and uh, do all sorts of things. I, I, I would have to look all of that up. But yes, definitely in architecture, technology is used quite a lot in order to uh, build 3D designs and those sorts of things, yes. Well, wouldn't it be fantastic to have a crystal ball to be able to answer that one? Um, I think there are the, the trends, is that, that slide that I put up in terms of the trends with uh, 3D printing, certainly robotics is very big. Artificial intelligence and robotics is, is going to be part of the future, not, not just in manufacturing but in service industry. So what's, what's going to happen is... We're going to have more people. Um, so, for example, in aged care, we're not going to have enough people to be able to, um, to do all the things that need to be done in aged care. So robots are going to be very important for that. So I think that robotics is a, certainly something that, uh, if you're interested in that, I would, I would definitely go down that path. Um, and uh, 3D printing driverless cars, all of that is, is coming. So I've got, I don't know what else will, but wearable technology is a very big trend right now. I'm sure you've seen all the ads on the television about sort of having Fitbits to monitor your, you know, how many steps a day and how much sleep you have and all those sorts of things. But that also introduces issues, doesn't it, about where that data is stored and who has access to it. So I think that that's, that's interesting as well. But who knows, like in five years from now, ten years from now, it'll, it's, going to be, it's going to be interesting. So the more we understand now, um, so rather than being scared of technology or worried about technology, we should learn about it so we can make informed decisions. Thank you.